Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the news analysis session by Shankar AS Academy dated 11th May 2021. The topic for today's discussion is given for your reference along with the page numbers of articles in various editions of the newspaper. Now, before discussing the articles, let us discuss few important preliminary questions asked in the year 2020. Now, let us see the first question. According to India's National Policy on Biofuels, which of the following can be used as a raw material for production of biofuels? 1. Cassava 2. Damaged wheat grains 3. Groundnut seeds 4. Horse gram 5. Rotten potatoes 6. Sugar beet Select the correct answer using the code given below. The options are given here. Option A. 1, 2, 5 and 6 only. Option B. 1, 3, 4 and 6 only. Option C. 2 3 4 and 5 only option d 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 see the answer for this question is option a 1 2 5 and 6 only let us see how see first you have to know what is biofuel see biofuel is nothing but a fuel that is produced from an organic matter say for example a living or once living material in a very short period of time okay so these are considered as biofuel so the hydrocarbon fuel that is produced from these organic matter are called as biofuel the state of matter may be a solid liquid or gaseous in nature see biofuels can be used to replace or can be used in addition to diesel petrol or other fossil fuels for transport and other applications hence for this purpose government has come up with a policy called national policy on biofuel which was made by the ministry of new and renewable energy during the year 2009 addition to this the biofuel can also be used for the purpose of generating heat and electricity and later in the year 2018 an upgraded version of national policy on biofuels was introduced to adapt to the changing times see in this national policy of biofuels the central government expanded the scope of raw material for biofuel production by allowing the use of sugar cane juice sugar containing materials like sugar beet sweet sorghum starch containing materials like corn cassava damaged food grains like wheat broken rice rotten potatoes unfit for human consumption for biofuel production hence the correct answer is option a 1 2 5 and 6 only let us move to the second question which of the following phrases defines the nature of the hundi generally referred to in sources of the post arsha period option a an advisory issued by the king to his subordinates option b a diary to be maintained for daily routine option c a bill of exchange option d an order from the feudal lord to his subordinates see this question asks about the nature of hundi uh, which is used or, or referred to in sources of the post arsha period the answer for this question is option c bill of exchange let us see about it see hundi is referred to a financial instruments that were developed in medieval india for the purpose of trade and credit transactions also they had multiple uses for example they were used as a remittance instrument see remittance is nothing but an account where the transfer of funds from one place to another will be accommodated for example if an indian living in dubai sends his salary or funds to his family living in kerala this amount transacted will be coming under an account called remittance so for this purpose hundis were used in medieval india also hundis were used in trade transactions as a bill of exchange so as a whole you can come to the conclusion that they were used as a credit instruments so the answer for this question is option c bill of exchange now let us come to the present according to the reserve bank of india a hundi is unconditional order in writing made by a person directing another to pay a certain sum of money to a person named in the order itself so hundi is being a part of informal system at present has no legal status and it is not covered under the negotiable instruments act of 1881 concluding that normally this hundi is regarded as bill of exchange they were often used as equivalents of checks issued by indigenous bankers now let us move to the third question a parliamentary system of government is one which option a all political parties in the parliament are represented in the government option b the government is responsible to the parliament and can be removed by it option c the government is elected by the people and can be removed by them option d the government is chosen by the parliament but cannot be removed by it before completion of a fixed term now let us discuss the options one by one consider the option a 
all political parties in the parliament are represented in the government no this is not the right answer see today there are many political parties in india for example if you take the parliament in today's parliament you can see members are represented from various parties such as congress dmk and many recognized parties but you can see that congress members are not ministers in today's government so by that logic you could eliminate this option a which says all political parties in the parliament are represented in the government now come to option c the government is elected by the people and can be removed by them see the first statement the government is elected by the people is correct but the next one which says the government can be removed by the people is wrong statement because it happens only in direct democracy whereas in india we are indirect democracy where the government continues unless and until it has a support in the parliament so option c is also eliminated now come to the option d the government is chosen by the parliament but cannot be removed by it before completion of a fixed term no this option is also wrong because if you know occasions where vajpayee government or former prime minister vp singh governments have been dismissed you can come to the conclusion that even before completion of a fixed term the government chosen by the parliament can be removed when no confidence motions or when the government loses its majority in the parliament the government chosen by the parliament can be removed before the completion of fixed term so option d is also eliminated the answer for this question is option b the government is responsible to the parliament and can be removed by it okay now let us see some features of parliamentary system see in our constitution although the constitution does not elaborately define the parliamentary form of government article 74 and 75 deals with the parliamentary system at the center and article 163 and 164 in the states deals with the parliamentary system the parliamentary system of government is the one in which the executive is responsible to the legislature for its policies and acts see the executives here are political executives for example the ministers if the ministers are coming up with new policies or acts the opposition parties the parliamentarians can ask questions during question hours or pass any motions and resolutions so that the discretion of ministers can be reduced now coming back to the parliamentary system the collective responsibility is the bedrock of parliamentary government in collective responsibilities the ministers are collectively responsible to the parliament in general but they are collectively responsible to lok sabha in particular which is said in the article 75 see the principle of collective responsibility implies that lok sabha can remove the ministry note that only lok sabha has the power to remove the ministry by passing a vote of no confidence whereas rajya sabha doesn't have that power so the answer is the government responsible to the parliament can be removed by it let us move to the last question who among the following rulers advised his subjects through this inscription whosoever praises his religious sect or blames other sect out of excessive devotion to his own sect with the view of glorifying his own sect he rather injures his own sect very severely option a ashoka option b samudra gupta option c harshavardhana option d krishna devaraya see this is a very much factual based question if you know about this inscriptions or if you have heard anywhere about this statement then only you can answer this question okay the answer for this question is option a ashoka see the great emperor ashoka is the third monarch of the mauryan dynasty he also converted to buddhism after witnessing a horrific effect of war in kalinga note that he became a champion and patron of buddhism and strove to spread dhamma throughout his empire and beyond for this reason he erected pillars and edicts all over the subcontinent and even in modern day afghanistan nepal bangladesh and pakistan to spread the buddha's word note that the rock edicts of ashoka were kept in public places and along the trade routes so that maximum number of people would read them out of all these rock edicts of ashoka the 14 rock edicts are considered as the major rock edicts these rock edicts talks about the moral duties of people how to conduct life and about ashoka's desire to be a good and benevolent ruler and about ashoka's work towards this end etc now let us see about the major rock edict 12 according to this edict growth in essentials of all religion can be done in different ways but all of them have their root restraint in speech see the restriction in speech is not about praising one's own religion but this restraint should be applicable while condemning the religion of others without a good cause and 
it also says that if there is a cause for criticism it should be done in a mild way by the inscription also adds that it is better to honor other religion for this reasons and it says that by doing so one's own religion benefits and so do other religions but while doing otherwise this arms one's own religion and the religion of others it also mentions that whosoever praises his own religion due to excessive devotion and condemns the other with the thought let me glorify my own religion it only harms his own religion so the answer for this question is option a ashoka let us move to the article's discussion the first topic for today's discussion is regarding pakistan government with to set new rules to meet fatf requirements see this article is related to the financial action task force note that pakistan was put on the gray list by the financial action task force hence by which the pakistan is taking necessary steps to remove itself from the gray list in this context let us learn about the financial action task force and the important list of fatf see the syllabus that is covered under this discussion is given for your reference now let us focus on fatf see financial action task force is the global money laundering and terrorist financing watchdog note that it was founded in the year 1989 on the initiatives of g7 which is nothing but the intergovernmental organization that consists of countries such as canada france germany italy japan united kingdom and the united states now coming back to fatf FATF is an intergovernmental body which sets up international standards that aim to prevent the illegal activities of money laundering and terrorist financing. It also takes steps to prevent the harm that these money laundering and terrorist finance cause to the society. Also, as a policy making body, this FATF works to generate the necessary will to bring about national legislative and regulatory reforms in these areas. The FATF secretary is located at the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development headquarters in Paris. Currently note that the FATF has 39 members including two regional organizations which are the European Commission and Gulf Cooperation Council. Important note that India is also a member of FATF. Now let us see the functions of FATF. See the FATF has developed the FATF recommendations or FATF standards which ensure coordinated global response to prevent organized crime corruption and terrorism they also help authorities to go after the money of criminals dealing in illegal drugs human trafficking and other crimes note that the FATF also works to stop funding for weapons of mass destruction Additionally the FATF reviews money laundering and terrorist financing techniques and continuously strengthens its standard to address new risks see these new risks may be like regulation of virtual assets which have been spread as cryptocurrencies gain popularity the FATF also monitors countries to ensure that they implement this FATF standards fully and effectively and for this purpose they continue to hold countries which do not comply with these recommendations Now let us learn about the important lists under FATF. First let us see about the grey lists. See the countries that are considered to be safe havens for supporting terror financing and money laundering are put in the FATF grey lists. This inclusion serves as a warning to the country that it may enter the black list in the future if it does not comply with the recommendations or standards that are put forward by the FATF. This list is also formally called as the other monitor jurisdiction and as of December 2020 15 nations are on the list note that Pakistan is one among them and it was added by the FATF under the gray list in June 2018 following that the country has been struggling to come out of it the FATF gray list makes it extremely difficult for Pakistan to get financial aid from IMF World Bank and European Union So for this reason Pakistan is keen to exit from the grey lists of the FATF to do that it is planning to introduce new rules relating to anti money laundering cases and change the prosecution process this article also says that the Pakistan is planning to transfer investigations and prosecutions of anti money laundering cases from police provincial anti corruption establishments and similar agencies to a specialized agencies hence pakistan believes that such measures will help the country to remove itself from the gray list of fatf now let us move on to the next list which is nothing but the black list this list is formally called as call for action see the black list is a list for countries that the financial action task force considers non cooperative in global effort to combat money laundering and financing of terrorism 
See, these countries support terror funding and money laundering activities and because of that, the FATF is compelled to put these countries under the blacklist. Also, the FATF revises the blacklist regularly by adding or deleting entries. As of March 2021, only two countries are on this blacklist. The countries are Iran and North Korea. Now, let us know what happens when a country is blacklisted. You must know that a blacklisted country may be subjected to economic sanctions by a member of FATF. Also, transactions involving those countries will be subjected to more levels of scrutiny by banks, which will put frictions on transactions that may discourage companies from doing businesses in those regions of the world. Moreover, the FATF blacklist is used by some international organizations and nations to set policies around trade and economic involvements with the blacklisted nation. With this, we come to the end of this topic. Let us move to the next topic. Moving to the next topic for the day's discussion. Adhikari elected leader of opposition. Now look at this article. Recently, assembly elections were held in many states and these states are appointing the new leader of opposition. Let us take this article as an opportunity to revise about the post called the leader of opposition. First, let us see the leader of opposition in the central government. See, in each house of the parliament, that is the Lok Sabha as well as in the Rajya Sabha, there is a leader of opposition. Note that the leader of the largest opposition party having not less than one tenth seats of the total strength of the house is recognized as the leader of the opposition in that house. To make it easier, you can understand by considering the Indian parliament. For example, take the Lok Sabha. There are around 545 members of parliament in Lok Sabha. So, as per this rule, you have to note that the leader of opposition must have the support of at least 55 MPs. And at the same time, he or she must be the leader of the largest opposition. For example, there are uh, three parties which are having the support of members numbering say 60, 70 and 80. In this case, the opposition party having the support of its 80 members can choose the leader of opposition. Now, coming back to the discussion. In a parliamentary system of government, the leader of opposition has a significant role to play. Note that his or her main functions are to provide a constructive criticisms of the policy of the government and to provide an alternative government. Because of this, the leader of opposition in the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha were accorded statutory recognition in the year 1977. Adding to this, they are also entitled to the salary, allowance and other facilities which are equivalent to the cabinet minister. See, it was only in the year 1969 that an official leader of opposition was recognized for the first time. And note that the same functionary in USA is known as minority leader. Taking the reference from British political system, there is a unique institution called a shadow cabinet. See, this shadow cabinet is formed by the opposition party to balance the ruling cabinet and to prepare its members for future ministerial posts. In this shadow cabinet, almost every member in the ruling cabinet is shadowed by a corresponding member in the opposition cabinet. Hence, this shadow cabinet serves as an alternative cabinet if there is a change of government. This is the reason why Ivor Jennings described the leader of opposition as an alternative prime minister. Adding to it, the leader of opposition enjoys the status of minister and he or she is paid by the government. Now, let us move to the leader of opposition in the state government. Similarly, the leader of opposition is an important functionary of the legislative assembly and also in legislative councils. Note that at present there are only six states that have a legislative council. See, the opposition leader in the state assembly is given the status of minister in recognition of his or her importance. Adding to it, the leader of largest opposition party having not less than one tenth seat of total strength of the assembly is recognized as the leader of opposition in that assembly. You have to note that this provision is similar to that of the parliament. Adding to it, the opposition leader raises matters of public importance and demands for detailed discussion on them. And also, the opposition leader extends his or her cooperation to the speaker in conducting the business of the house. You have to know that the leader of opposition is provided a seat in the front row and a room in the assembly with secretariat and also with other facilities. The leader of opposition also enjoys certain privileges on ceremonial occasions such as escorting the speaker elect to rostrum. And you have to know that the leader of opposition is given a seat in the front row at the time of by the governor in both the assembly as well as the council. With this we have come to the end of the topic discussion. Now let us move to the third topic. Now let us move to the third topic for today's discussion. 
SEBI's Sustainability Reporting Norms Mandate ESG Overview. See, the news article mentions that the Securities and Exchange Board of India has notified new sustainability reporting norms or format for the top 1000 listed companies. See, the sustainability reporting is the disclosure and communication of environmental, social and governance goals. You have to note that it also includes the company's progress towards them. See, the benefit of sustainability reporting includes improved corporate reputation, building consumer confidence, increased innovation and even improvement of the risks management. Now, the new format for ESG reporting is Business Responsibility and Sustainability Report. Note that it replaces the existing Business Responsibility Report. The said BRSR seeks the disclosure from the listed entities on their performance against the nine principles of national guidelines on responsible business conduct. So, based on this, the company now have to provide an overview of their material risks and opportunities. See, this is to be provided along with the opportunity to mitigate or adopt to the risks plus the financial implications of it. As the news article mentions, the social related disclosures will cover 1. The workforce and the value chain under which companies will have to disclose the gender and social diversity of employees and the measures for different abled employees and workers and even including the occupational health and safety etc. Second, it covers the communities under which the corporate social responsibilities have to be disclosed. Third, it also covers consumers under which complaints in respect of data privacy and cyber security to be disclosed. Note that the reporting under each principle is divided into essential and leadership indicators. See, the essential indicators are required to be reported on a mandatory basis but for the leadership indicators, the reporting is voluntary. Also, BRSR will be applicable from the financial year 2022 to 2023. Note that the purpose of BRSR is to enable comparability across companies, sectors and time. One of its main benefit is that such disclosures will be helpful for investors to make better investment decisions. Additionally, it will also enable companies to engage more meaningfully with their stakeholders as it will encourage the companies to look beyond financial and to focus towards social and environmental impacts. So, BRSR is Indian format. We also have internationally accepted reporting frameworks under which listed entities are already preparing and disclosing sustainability report. This includes GRI which is nothing but the global reporting initiative which is commonly used reporting framework globally. Second one is the SASB standards which is also called as sustainability accounting standards board standards. The third and the final one is TCFD recommendations or task force on climate related financial disclosures which is created by the international body called financial stability board to which India is also a member. With this we have come to the end of this topic discussion. Let us move to the next one. Our next news discussion is going to be based on the opinion article titled Decoding Inequality in a Digital World. As the title hints, the article talks about the role played by the technology in enhancing the social inequalities especially during the pandemic times. So in this light, let us see some important points mentioned in the article. The syllabus covered by this article is given below for your reference. See, the author begins the article by mentioning about the role of coronavirus pandemic in accelerating the use of digital technologies even for essential services like health and education. As we know, it has further aggravated the already existing inequality. In this context, the author talks about the economic inequality and the social inequality. Adding to it, it has also altered the access to education and health to be more inequitable in an already unequal society. See, the author divides the editorial into three parts. In the first part, she talks about the authenticity of uninterrupted education among the poor sections of the society. And in the second part, she highlights the challenges in digitization of healthcare. Further, in the last part, the author hints about the possibilities for future exploitation of people's data, which is nothing but a focus on data privacy. Now, let us see in brief about each segment. First comes the education. Even though the switch to online education has been smooth to some, it posed great challenges for many others, especially for the poorer sections. And this was evident when the students took their lives since they could not cope up with their online educations. But as per the government, no one has been deprived of education because of online education. But in reality, this isn't true. 
This is because not everyone could afford a computer or enjoy access to internet facilities. It cannot be denied that smartphones with data have improved access in recent times, but even then a significant number of most vulnerable are struggling for it. And as per the statistics by the author, between 27% to 60% of the students could not access online education for a range of reasons like lack of devices or shared devices and inabilities to buy data packs. Apart from this unstable internet connectivity, the absence of learning environment also plays a major role. So according to the author, even though the online education resembles an uninterrupted one, in reality it is only the privileged who are benefiting and getting ahead and not the poor. In the second segment, the author focuses on healthcare. See the author points out that India's repeated low public spending on health has resulted in high share of out of pocket health expenditure. Remember that the out of pocket health expenditure refers to the direct payments made by the individuals to healthcare providers at the time of service use. See as per the statistics presented by the author in the year 2018 the out of pocket expenditure in India was over 60 percentage. In fact even in a highly privatized health system like the US this estimation was merely 10 percentage. As we are aware Currently, there is an ongoing shortage of essentials like drugs, hospital beds, oxygen, vaccines, etc. At such a juncture, developing an app is being seen as a solution for allocation of various healthcare services. The challenge here is the lack of available adequate resources for these platforms to allocate effectively. Moreover, the lack of adequate resources have led to development of a black market for scarce services like oxygen which need to be prevented. So at such scenarios, these digital solutions will only lead to additional burden for those in search of these services. Since along with the paperwork which has to be done by the patients, they will have to navigate digital work as well. For example, booking a slot in Covin becomes much harder for those patients who are without phones, computers and the internet. Note that such app based solutions have got the potential to exclude the poor entirely or to reduce their access to these scarce health services. Now moving to the last segment of this article, the author focuses on data privacy by which she says the potential for such digital services creates an infrastructure for future exploitation of people's data. For example, she says the interoperability of the patient's electronic and health records can be achieved by decentralizing digital storage itself. But still the Indian government intends to create a centralized database and this proves to be a matter of concern. This is because due to the lack of data privacy law in India, there is a possibility for our health records to end up with the private entities even without our consent and they can also be weaponized against us. Moving with it, the author concludes by asserting that unless health expenditures on basic health services is increased, apps such as Arogya Setu, Aadhaar and digital health IDs can only improve a little. Similarly, unlike the laws against Medical malpractices are enforced strictly, digital solutions will only distract us from the real problems. So with these ideas in mind, let us move on to the next part of the news discussion. Now let us take this editorial article on the edge. See this article talks about the need for an international pressure on Israel to treat Palestinians with dignity. So in this light, let us see in brief about the Israel-Palestine conflict and also some important points from the article. See, after the First World War, British took control over the area known as Palestine. This land was inhabited by a Jewish minority and an Arab majority. Later on, the international community gave British the task for establishing a national home in Palestine for minority Jewish people. And this later on led to the clashes between the Arab majority and the minority Jewish people since both the Jews and Palestinian Arabs claimed the land and opposed the move. Later on, in 1947, the UN voted for Palestine to be split into separate Jewish and Arab states. Adding to it, the UN also said the Jerusalem should become an international city. However, this met rejections from the Arab side and was never implemented. Being unable to solve the problem, in the year 1948, the British rulers left the state and this resulted in Jewish leaders declaring the creation of the state of Israel. Following that, many Palestinians objected this move and a war followed. Finally, the fighting ended in a ceasefire and this time the Israel controlled most of the territory. 
Note that Jerusalem was divided between Israeli forces in the west and the Jordanian forces in the east. See the location of West Bank and several other places in Israel and Palestine have been given through a map. The aspirants can have a look of it. Later on, in another war in year 1967, Israel occupied East Jerusalem and the West Jerusalem as well as most of the Syrian Golan Heights and even the Gaza Strait and Egyptian Sinai Peninsula. This led to the Palestinian refugees and their descendants to live in Gaza and West Bank as well as in the neighboring states such as Jordan, Syria and Lebanon. And neither they nor their descendants have been allowed by Israel to return to their homes since according to Israel such a move will threaten its existence as a Jewish state. Note that Israel claims the whole of Jerusalem as its capital and in the past 50 years Israel has built settlements in these areas. Whereas the Palestinians claim East Jerusalem as the capital of a future peninsular state which often causes tensions. Usually these tensions are often high between Israel and Palestinians living in East Jerusalem, Gaza and West Bank. See, most countries have not recognized Israel claims over the city and are of the view that its status should be resolved as a part of final Israel-Palestinian settlement and not by a unilateral decision. When you take Israel, it mostly holds on the status quo through force and the ongoing violence is the result of tensions build up since the start of Ramzan in mid-April 2021. The threatened eviction of some Palestinian families in East Jerusalem has also caused rising anger which later on led the Israel to evict Palestinians from East Jerusalem which is viewed as the attempt to forcibly expand Jewish settlements in the Arab neighborhood. Even though its actions are inviting condemnations, still there is no positive improvement in its own ways. By that, this proves that the need for international community to pressurize the Israeli government to at least treat the Palestinians with dignity. Now, let us move to the prelims practice questions. Let us move to the first practice question of this session. Consider the following statements. Statement 1. In the Lok Sabha, a leader of opposition was recognized for the first time in the year 1969. Statement 2. In the Lok Sabha, if a party does not have a minimum of 75 members, its leaders cannot be recognized as the leader of opposition. Which of the above statement is or are correct? Option A. One only. Option B. Two only. Option C. Both one and two. Option D. Neither one nor two. Consider the first statement. It says that the leader of opposition was recognized for the first time in the year 1969. Yes, this is the correct statement. It was only in the year 1969 that an official leader of opposition was recognized for the first time. And you have to note that although it was recognized in the year 1969, the leader of opposition in Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha were accorded statutory recognition in the only in the year 1977. Now consider the second statement. It says that the party has to have a minimum of 75 members if its leaders has to be recognized as a leader of opposition. No, this is the wrong statement. See, minimum of 10% of seats are required to be the leader of opposition. If you consider the Lok Sabha, there are nearly 545 members at present. So, going by that numbers, 10% means it is nearly 55 seats. So, with the minimum of 55 seats, a party can appoint its leader and it can be recognized as the leader of opposition. Let us see the second question. Which among the following are functions of Securities and Exchange Board of India? Statement 1. Promoting the development of securities market. Statement 2. Regulating the business in stock exchanges. Statement 3. Registering stock brokers and share transfer agents. Statement 4. Prohibiting insider trader in securities. Select the correct answer from code given below. Option A. 1 and 2 only. Option B. 1, 2 and 4 only. Option C. 2, 3 and 4 only. Option D. 1, 2, 3 and 4. See the answer for this question is option D. 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now let us discuss the answer. C. SEBI was established in the year 1992 in accordance with the provisions of Securities and Exchange Board of India Act 1992. So, it is a statutory body and note that it consists of a chairman and 8 members. You have to know that out of 8, the 3 members are nominated by RBI and the remaining 5 members and chairman are appointed by the central government. Among the 3 members who are nominated by the RBI, Two members are from the officials of Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Corporate Affairs while the another member is from amongst the officials of RBI itself. Now let us discuss about the basic functions. 
the basic functions of sebi are to protect the interest of investors in securities also to promote the development of securities market and to regulate the security market and to deal with matters related to it its other functions include regulating the business in stock exchanges and any other security markets including registering and regulating the working of stock brokers sub brokers share transfer agents and other intermediaries also its other function include prohibiting insider traders in security you have to note that insider trader is the illegal practice of trading on stock exchange to one's own advantage through having access to confidential informations so by this option d 1 2 3 and 4 is the right answer let us move to the next question this is a map based geography question let us have a look at it question israel is bordered by which of the following countries statement 1 lebanon statement 2 jordan statement 3 saudi arabia statement 4 egypt statement 5 turkey select the correct answer using the code given below option a 1 2 3 and 5 only option b 1 2 and 4 only option c 2 3 and 5 only option d 1 3 and 4 only see this is a map based question if you are clear with the locations of these countries you could come to the conclusion the correct answer for this question is option b 1 2 and 4 only that is israel is bordered by lebanon jordan and egypt see the map for your reference is given here you can have a look at it you have to note that turkey is very much far away from israel so if you eliminate the fifth option you could come to option b and option d also you have to note that saudi arabia does not have a border with israel so the right answer is option b 1 2 and 4 only these are few mains questions that are given for your practice and you may write and post them in the comment section for peer review that's it for today's discussion if you like the video kindly press the like button comment share and subscribe to shankar ias academy for further updates thank you